problem. Every day I see people with an incurable disease. That disease is called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. There are no survivors of this disease, and I have really nothing to offer my patients except for compassion, palliative care, and the promise that every day I'll look for both the cause and the cure for their disease. The hope is that the extraordinary innovation in science and technology will lead to new treatments for ALS and for other degenerative diseases of the nervous system. We're here today to tell you about our experience in developing one of those new treatments. And that new treatment is the injection of stem cells into the spinal cord to preserve neurological function. Our success thus far is in safely injecting these cells into the spinal cords of 14 ALS patients. We have not harmed these people with the injections, and so we have achieved our initial goal of showing that the procedure is safe. As amazing as it seems, and it is amazing, that stem cell transplantation for ALS is no longer just a theory. We can actually do this. And although we're the first ones to take on this approach, I'm the neurologist and Nick here is a neurosurgeon, there are now research teams around the world who are developing an array of cell types, each with their own beneficial properties for their own clinical trials. So we have every reason to believe that with collaboration and with the experience gained by trial and error, we'll be able to provide an effective therapy for people with ALS. But building upon this first success is testing whether this new and promising therapy will actually ameliorate the disease we're trying to treat. But that effort, that effort is being hampered by a regulatory system that really is built to minimize risk, even if it stifles innovation. Our message to you today is that we must reconsider, we must redefine, and we must recalculate what is acceptable risk. And that risk must fit the emerging technologies and therapies that hold the enormous potential to transform the treatment of disease and the practice of medicine. What you are watching is, for us, the moment that the eagle landed. This is the first time we injected stem cells into the human spinal cord. The device that you see there was developed in my lab over six years to pump stem cells into a part of the spinal cord called the ventral horn where motor neurons live. Now, stem cells are amazingly versatile cells that someday will have the ability to replace the lost motor neurons of ALS. But today, we're targeting the repair of the environment surrounding those motor neurons so that the motor neurons can withstand the onslaught of ALS and more importantly, or just as importantly, reconnect with muscle so that I can give back strength to my patients. It's not as easy as it looks. Picture the diagram behind me. The spinal cord's cross-sectional area is about the size of a dime. The target that we're trying to hit is about 1.5 millimeters squared. It's about approximately like trying to hit the chin on Roosevelt's face, except that you have to hit it repeatedly. And if that needle shifts in the low back, lower spinal cord, we'll put a patient in a wheelchair unable to walk. If it slips in the upper spinal cord, where we need to go to, teach, to treat ALS, we'll take away the use of their hands, their legs, and we'll put them on a ventilator, which is precisely what we set out to avert. Look, what I'm showing you here is complicated. The regulatory processes that exist today was developed for the testing of drugs, not what I've just shown you. And in the exciting era of personalized medicine, we're going to be able to have increasing technology, increasing complexity applied to smaller and smaller groups of patients. The FDA released a statement in October acknowledging the need to update their regulatory scientific paths to promote technology and promote innovation. But we have a long way to go. So just all of you, imagine for a minute that you woke up this morning and you reached over to silence your alarm clock or to turn off your cell phone, and your index finger, it, it just wouldn't work. But in a matter of a few years, you'll be unable to breathe and you'll be unable to even speak. And eventually, you'll be given the choice by doctors like me, either to go into hospice and prepare to die, or to be placed on a ventilator. This is Melissa. 
I first met Melissa when she was about 34 years old, when she first came to see me. Melissa and her husband graduates of the University of Georgia. She now is a housewife, and she has an 18-month-old child, Matthew, who you see here. She came to me because over the past six months, she developed weakness in her right hand, some stiffness, twitching of her muscles. Unfortunately, I was the one that gave her the devastating diagnosis that she had ALS, and I really had nothing to offer her. Two years later, she was devastated. But over about the first six months, you can see her here, still able to spell, smile, still able to speak, but in a wheelchair. But over the next two years, she became completely immobile. And she was, had to be fed through a tube. She was attached to a ventilator, unable to speak. But she was fully aware of all that was going on around her. This is ALS. For me, ALS is embodied by JT. He's 10 years younger than I am. And when I met him, he was lying bedbound in the middle of the action. His young sons were running in and out of the room. There's a portrait hanging over his bed from his honeymoon. He was holding his wife in his arms. When I was there, his wife was struggling to decode the questions he was trying to ask me by the pattern of the blinking in his eyelids, the only muscle left to him. And the question he was asking me was, Tell me how I can fight this. Tell me how I can survive for my family. This is a man that's willing to accept risk. Doc, how did I get this? You know, Nick, I don't know how you got this. I don't know why anybody has this disease. This is a pretty rare disease, ALS. It occurs in only about one in 100,000 people. It doesn't discriminate, and everybody's at risk. So. I don't know why you have it. What we do know is that the cells in your spinal cord, they're dying. And they're dying, and, and when they do die, your muscles won't work anymore. We've begun to understand that the environment of your spinal cord may be toxic to those motor neurons. Unfortunately, patients like you die within two or three years of diagnosis. I am not just going home to die. If you don't have anything that will work for me, give me the next best thing, something that might work. Well. I can tell you that we've been trying this new thing with stem cells. Um, what we've discovered is that stem cells can repair the cells around the spinal cord. And we haven't tried it in people yet. All we right. Have, we have begun, though, to try it in mice and rats. And it seems to work in them. We have a trial that we're thinking about trying. All right. Count me in. Well, it's pretty risky, so I want you to think about that. It's major surgery, and that surgery could kill you. And in fact, we don't know what these, spinal towards, what these spinal stem cells will do inside your spinal cord. We don't even know what kind of dose to give you. So what we do know is that we can't cure you necessarily with this, but we could hurt you. Look, Doc, you've just told me that this disease is going to take away everything I have and everything my family has. If there's any chance that it'll help me, I'll take it. And I'll take it for the next guy, if we can learn something from all it. All right, all right. I'll talk to the biotech guys and see if I can get you into the trial. OK, well, I have to admit, I was pretty skeptical when I first saw that you were going to have this idea of uh, using stem cells for ALS. But your initial safety studies were really impressive. Going into the lower spinal cord, that was a really good idea because it was really safe. But my patients need spinal stem cells into their cervical spinal cord, into the neck, to protect the motor neurons that affect their breathing. Can my patient get into your trial? Well, I'm sorry, Jonathan, but the FDA feels understandably concerned about the possibility of us really damaging these patients. As you know, injecting the, uh, the upper spinal cord is extremely dangerous. But this is where we have to go in order to make a difference. And we need a product soon. We don't just need to go into the upper cervical spinal cord. We need more injections, and we need higher cell concentrations. But the venture money that we have will only take us for five years. This extra year could kill us. We're going as fast as we can, honestly. OK. Well, I spoke to the biotech guys. They said that they need to do more rat studies, that the FDA says it's too high a risk. So I'm sorry we can't put you in the trial. Too risky for who? I'm the one who's dying here. Can't the FDA make an exception? I don't know, but I get your problem. I'll go talk to the FDA. I understand the need for good initial safety data, but 
my patients are desperate, and we have little else to offer them. They understand the risks of the trial, and they are willing to take those risks. They see participation in this trial really as their way of fighting back at this disease and helping us with the science. None of them wants to wait for the animal data that you're asking for, and besides, you know that rat data doesn't necessarily suggest that there's no risk for humans. Look, John, it's not us. If this thing turns out to be a disaster, it's the American people that will hold us responsible. We can't change our methodology on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, I understand. You guys are in a really tough position, and you have a tough job to do, but I just needed to ask. So I spoke to the FDA, and they said, no, you'll have to be patient. John, I don't have time to be patient. If I can't get into that trial, I'm going overseas. I've seen the ads on the internet. I know there are stem cell trials abroad. I know they're risky. I know you're going to tell me they're risky and expensive. But I'm going to go where I need to go to have hope. So our patients, they're lining up to join in on this approach. And to them, the possible rewards outweigh the considerable risk. So Nick, whose risk is it anyway? Well, the risk to us as investigators is to our careers. The risk to the biotechs is their profits and ultimately their existence. What we share in common with our patients is that the risk of a medical disaster is balanced by the risk that we'll fail to make progress. In contrast, the FDA risks public condemnation, condemnation by you and I, if they allow a therapy that is fundamentally unsafe. The agency is not rewarded for accelerating the process of discovery. Ours is a risk-averse society, but we must balance our adversity to medical risk with the right of the individual to accept personal risk, to pioneer as American. In the absence of a validated therapy, we must offer our patients the right to have this next best thing, a promising therapy. And the risk, if we don't, is huge for all of us. America has dominated the world in the production of therapies, and yet today our patients are going overseas for hope. We have, in fact, forced innovation offshore. And as that innovation follows the path of least resistance into more permissive regulatory and financial climates, the scientific rigor will suffer. And in so doing, the chances of new therapies will be diminished. Now look, make no mistake about it, I'm not just talking about ALS here. Spinal cord stem cell transplantation for ALS is the canary in the coal mine. The era of personalized medicine is here. Biotech companies are already marketing personalized genomics. Go into the tent and look. And in that era, therapies of ever-increasing complexity will be applied to ever smaller groups of patients. It's simply impossible to apply designer therapeutics to the, to the standard paradigm for approval, the randomized placebo-controlled trial. But we're not talking about changing the rules for every disease. However, in cases of rapidly fatal diseases or intractable suffering, the system has to change. But let's not lose perspective. In the last 10 years, we've made a lot of progress. We've come from biomanufacturing of stem cells through proof of principle experiments in small animals, device development, technique development, and ultimately safety experiments that allowed us to do the first stem cell trial effectively. As we've grown, the regulators have grown as well, evolving. And there's hope for our patients. That hope springs from the rapid pace of new restorative therapies. These ideas are emerging so fast that we can't translate them. And that backlog is at once at the heart of our dilemma as well as the hope for our patients. The decision to proceed with innovation must shift from a central, unified system back into the hands of the physicians and patients, albeit under supervision. I don't know what form that supervision will take, but it needs to be decentralized flexible, and capable of acknowledging both the risks and the benefits. This is an emergency. People are dying. And it's not just enough for us to hold their hand and watch them, drim and watch them just dwindle away in front of us. We need to rethink how much risk that our patients should tolerate and what kind of risks our society can tolerate if we are, and what we are gonna, what's going to happen if we remain so risk-averse. It's like having a home that you treasure. When you paint the kitchen, you put down a drop cloth so the drips don't get on the floor. But when that house catches fire and your kids are asleep upstairs, you're ready and willing to have the firefighters come in with their axes and break through the doors and do whatever it takes to save those kids upstairs. 
ALS is that house on fire. And it is burning up. And we need to do something to save that house on fire, to save our patients. Thank you very much.